Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Coach Patrick Precourt here. Welcome to this week's Peak Performance Mastery. Psyched to be here, psyched to have you here. Excited for today's call as uh, as we usually are each week. Um, we'll give everybody a moment to hop on. Look at that, Matt, right there, right on time, brother, with that chime in. Welcome to you, sir. Got a, uh, got a great topic for you today. And uh, so just uh, as you guys are joining... Uh, and thanks for that, Rita. Rita's joining us as well, which is awesome, letting letting us know that we can see each other, which is good stuff. Hey, as you guys uh, jump in, give me a uh, give me a shout out, and uh, if you if you want me to see your name, you have to include your name on it. Um, it doesn't always show your name through, just so I can say hi back to you. And uh, if you want to, tell me where you're checking in from as well. Uh, give me a little feel for where where everybody is. Um, so these topics that we discuss come straight from you, um, from the conversations I have with you guys one-on-one -on -one to questions that are sent in on a weekly basis as it relates to uh, us getting more out of what we're trying to do, right? Um, ultimately, we're in this room together to discuss one thing, ultimately one thing, and that's getting results. And, you know, results can be measured in a bunch of different ways, which we'll always talk about. But at the end of the day, man, what matters here is taking all the information, all the knowledge, all the expertise and crossing that bridge into the space of results. Wayne checking in from Fort Worth. Good to see you here, Wayne. Mr. Tim from Arkin. Uh, great to have you here, Tim. Um, Lisa uh, from local here. Great to have you here, Lisa. Uh, Mr. Matt, I know where you're at, brother. Nebraska. Arturo from Detroit, a little north and west of me. So we're going to get into I put together a presentation for you. Uh, I want to welcome all of our new listeners and viewers that are on the call here today. Um, great to have you here. And if you'd like, uh, let, let me know if you're brand new, if this is your first time to the call. Um, Kate, checking all the way in from Manila in the Philippines. Great to have you here, Kate. Gary out of... L.A., Southern California, Laurel from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, Randy down in Concord, North, North Carolina. If you're brand new to the call, first time on Peak Performance Mastery, um, raise your hand. Let me know. Give you guys a special salute, special call out. As always on these weekly calls, we're going to get going here in uh, about two minutes. I'm going to ask you guys for just a little grace in terms of um, we'll get into some good stuff, right? We'll get deep in. And all I ask is, man, if, if something comes across as, you know, rubs you the wrong way, just let it fly, okay? Don't get hung up anything. Your your, your, your time is too valuable uh, to, to let something rub you the wrong way. Kind of makes sense. We have too much work to do in too short a period of time. So I had the pleasure of speaking at an event last week. Friday, Thursday, I spoke at it. I got home Friday um, out in Scottsdale, Arizona. Group of entrepreneurs that focus exclusively in the um, residential assisted living space. And, you know, one of the topics I brought up in our presentation uh, was built around the hourglass here, right? And the idea that there's some great uncertainty in the hourglass and some certainty as well right um the uncertainty is we have no idea how much salt or sand is actually up here we have no idea how long it's going to take to get down here effectively when it's going to run out but we do have one thing for certain that we know and that's it that once this once this time is run out it never goes back up right such is life. Those same uncertainties and absolute certainty exist in our lives. And I bring that up today on a Monday morning. Just remind us to, to go through this game with, with, with intention. Don't just roll with the punches. You don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Right? We're here for a reason. Let's, let's make the best of it. All right. We're going to kick into this. Hold on one sec as we share the screen. 
you know, pull up a presentation I put together for you that will guide us through this next next session here. If you're a new new viewer, new listener today, please give me a shout out. Let me know it's the first time to the call. We'll share a screen. Share a screen. Uh, we're gonna share that screen. And we'll go here and here. All right. So the only challenge with me sharing the screen like this, hold on one sec. Let me see if I can change that. Is I lose I, I lose you guys. Let me pull if I can pull this over here to here. And then give me one second, if you will. Uh-huh. All right. So do me a favor. I'm going to lose the the chat box while I pull up my presentation, okay? Um, so uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. Load up your questions. I'll get to the questions, okay? As we, uh, after I do the presentation. Do one more thing here. Pull it up. Back. Boom. There. And present. There we go. All right. So what you should see here right now is the opening page of our presentation. Work to achieve, not to avoid failure. And the first question I ask you, right, is what goes through your mind when you read this? Because this can fall two ways. Work to achieve, not to avoid failure. One is you could be reading it such as, why would we work to achieve failure when we should be avoiding failure, right? Right? Work to achieve, not to avoid failure. And the second would be work to achieve, meaning your intention is to your to achieve. Your intention is not to avoid failure. Your intention is to achieve. In other words, fight to win. Don't fight not to lose. And there's a completely different way you approach the game. My son learned this in wrestling early on in his high school career. And he went from, he had, he had never wrestled prior until uh, starting his, his first freshman year in high school. And he got destroyed. Um, he got thrown in on a varsity starting position on a, the state championship team. And the only reason he was there is because they needed someone in his weight class. So he was wrestling against kids that had eight and 10 and sometimes 12 years of wrestling underneath their belt already by the time they're because he's wrestling against seniors right that started wrestling when they're six years old he was getting destroyed but it wasn't until the end of his sophomore year and his junior year where he started getting his feet underneath him and we shifted his approach instead of fighting not to lose which is the very defensive mode fighting to win and that's when he started to see success he stopped being afraid of losing and appreciate that losing is part of the game. And every loss is a step closer to the next win. Uh, we can get caught up in this game of life and a game of business and game of entrepreneurialism the same way. Before you know it, we're dying a slow death in this fight not to lose mentality. So that's what I want to talk about today. How to get up. When you're going to get knocked down, then what? You know, we've talked in the past, and I know some of us are new to these calls, right? We've talked in the past about peaks and valleys in life. Well, the peaks in life are where we celebrate life, and the valleys are where we learn about life, right? And without valleys, you couldn't have peaks. So we have to learn to appreciate that the two are codependent on one another. 
the highs, the successes, the wins in our life are predicated on the learning lessons, which are often done, at least the best lessons are, are done through the failures in life. You're going to get knocked down and then what? We're so afraid of the loss, the fear of, 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 of failure that oftentimes it prohibits us from moving forward. And think about this for a second. What we're fearing most is failing, yet the act of not moving forward virtually guarantees all that we fear. We're going to fail as a result of standing still. My great concern is not whether you have failed, Abraham Lincoln, but whether you, whether you are content with your failure. And that brings up a, a sore spot in society right now, I'd say right now, it's probably been this way forever, right? That the masses of people, and I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, I'm not judging people. It's a, more of an observation than anything else. So I feel everybody has the right to be who they want to be in any way they want to do it. But I also know through observation that the masses of people, the majority of people, accept mediocrity as a norm, as an acceptable way to go through life. And we do this because, well, one, it's well supported by those around us. And two, it's safer than testing our boundaries. You've heard the cliche before. How, how, how would you ever know how far you could go without risking going too far, pushing your limits? When you're skiing and you're trying to get better, the only way to get better is ski on that edge, on that very, very fine edge of in control and out of control. And you know where you're at because, well, you're occasionally falling. But you wouldn't grow, you wouldn't be able to advance your skills if you didn't ski right on that fine line between in control and out of control. So it's not the getting knocked down that matters. It's our willingness to accept that as our as as good as we can do. So I'm going to go through five parts of this with you today. Okay, pretty cool. Five ways to harness power challenge. One, acknowledge the challenge. Two, identify the cause. Three, step back. Which I'm going to describe. It's an important part. Four, solicit help, and five is to take action. Right. The most critical part, quite honestly, is when we're in trouble, is going in a different direction, getting out of trouble. It's moving on. So that's why this is such a key step in the process here. I'm going to, you guys and guys, I'm going to do one thing. I just want to make sure, like I, this, this, this part of this presentation where I am on, I'm on the slides, but I cannot see you guys at all. Um, this allows me from knowing for certain that everything is streaming fine. <laughs> so I'm going to send one text to Miss Rita and just make sure this is going well. And I know you guys can comment back and forth right now, but I can't see it. Hold on one sec. One sec here. So we're going to go through these five steps, okay? And then I'm going to click back over and we'll kind of open it up in a QA and a here. Five steps to harness the power challenge. This can be applied when we're knocked down, in a rut, failed something, stalled, questioning ourselves, doubting ourselves, dealing with people around us that are pulling us back down, lost our way, lost our motivation. We can apply to all of the above, okay? Number one, acknowledge the challenge. So in normal everyday life, I share with people I call it debriefing, right? And it goes like this. Acknowledge what just happened. Write down exactly what worked, what didn't work. Now analyze what you learn and finally Decide what you're going to do differently. It's a five-step debrief. We apply this to every aspect of life. Everything we do every single day that is worth doing should get re it should get debriefed. And this could happen from a 
a small conversation you just had with somebody all the way up to a, a presentation you did up on stage to a, 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 an argument you got into with your wife. It doesn't matter, right? If we want to grow from it, we should debrief it. And everything starts with acknowledging the challenge, right? Put things in perspective. This is objective. This is not subjective. Admit the setback. It's, it's what separates it from any other event here. Accept responsibility and move on. Now, there's two parts of responsibility. We hear this word all the time, right? Responsibility. And adults are fairly okay at taking responsibility. We're not great. And sometimes it taps at our ego. I get it, right? But we're okay. But where we suck is accountability. And responsibility without accountability is hollow. It's like giving you a coffee cup without the coffee, you're like, well, that was cute, Pat, but I really wanted the coffee. No shit. I get it. That's responsibility and accountability. Responsibility void of accountability is an empty coffee cup. And it goes like this. Responsibility is owning it. Yeah, I accept responsibility for that. Accountability is doing something about it so you don't repeat the same thing again. You change something going forward. We grow from the event. So when you hear me talk about responsibility, okay? Understand that it includes accountability and you are not taking responsibility if you are unwilling to make the change. Tony Robbins puts it in a very unique way. There's no such thing as failure. There's only results. Every single thing we do from our decision on to our actions, every single thing we do has a reaction, a result. And no results are wrong. They're all insightful and tell us exactly what to do next. Look at every reaction, every result we get, no different than the GPS responding to the turns you make. When you make a correct turn, it simply guides you to your next turn. When you make an incorrect turn, what does it do? It corrects your course and directs you to your next turn. They're all just results. But we start to learn quickly ones that move us quicker towards the outcome and those that don't. But no matter what, whether we went left or right, the next turn is the closest path to the outcome. That's why they're results and they're equal. We often find that our wrong turns give us more information than our right turns as it relates to our growing and our learning curves. So step one, acknowledge the challenge, call it out for what it is. Do it very objectively, put things in perspective, accept it as a setback, right? Take 100% responsibility, but plan on doing things different. Move on to the next. Number two, identify the cause. So this is not blame, okay? And when we fall into the blame game, we give up authority, we give up control. When we say, no, not my responsibility, it's someone else's responsibility, what we're really saying is, no, I ain't going to do crap about it. Somebody else caused it, therefore they got to fix it. And when we give up responsibility, break that word down, respondability, ability to respond. When we give up our ability to respond, we're giving up control and power of our, of our outcomes. How much longer are we willing to do that for? I mean, come on. This ride goes by pretty damn quick. How much longer are we willing to let somebody else pull the strings? So it's time we stop the blame and just own it. But Pat, what if it wasn't directly my fault? Who cares? By taking responsibility, we're buying the power to do something about it. Who gives a crap? Who caused it? Doesn't matter. You want full control of fixing it. And yeah, you know what? There's times when this may, may, may mean we got to eat a little humble pie, stuff down that ego a little. Who cares? Like I opened this show. Our goal are results. I mean, ask yourself an honest question right now, right? How much would your life changed if you could start achieving the results, the outcomes that you've been so committed to achieve? What? How would that affect your life? And the answer, and I know the answer, for most of us, it's tremendously. And let's agree also that it's not that we lack the knowledge. 
the wisdom, the insight, the know-how. That's not our problem. It simply isn't. But there is a bridge that has to get built between where we're at and where we want to go. And taking ownership of it is step number one. We've got to be in complete control of what happens next. This is no different than a fixed mindset versus a growth-oriented mindset. Growth-oriented mindset is 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 asphyxiated on one thing, growing, getting to the results. A fixed mindset is going to sit here and protect our own ego. Live in a space of scarcity. That self-image is more important than actually getting the results. Starting to see how silly we are sometimes, the way we think sometimes. You ever do this little exercise? If you haven't, I, I certainly recommend it. Stare at yourself in a mirror. It can't be anybody else around, no noise, nothing else going on. You have to be in a very, very localized place in your mind, meaning that no other mental, emotional distractions going on. Stare in the mirror at you. And keep asking yourself, who do you see staring back? And the truth of it is, the first person we see are our one or two or three top shortcomings. And that's some of the most insightful well, insight. That's kind of redundant. Information that we could possibly get. That tells us exactly the behavioral change we got to focus on. That moment of truth right there is gold. As you can imagine, the more often you do this little exercise, the more brilliant insight you get. Clearer it gets on exactly what's between where we're at and where we want to go. And we talked about last Thursday in my keynote that the biggest hurdle is always the same hurdle and it's universal amongst everyone. It's six inches long. It's between our left ear and our right ear. The beauty in it is we're, we're the steward of that. We're in charge of that. The challenge is we're not always very good at leading that space. Identify the cause. Take ownership for why you're where you're at so that you can get the hell out the fastest. You know, we talk about peaks and valleys and in the valleys where we learn about life. Here's an interesting takeaway in that discussion of peaks and valleys. The goal is to spend less time in the valleys and more time on the peaks, right? Get down there, get your message, get the hell out, get back on top, enjoy life, celebrate, right? The challenge is when we're down in the valleys, what determines how long we stay there, the decisions we make while we're there. Are we sitting there Oh, woe is me and, and, and victimizing ourselves and blaming others. And if so, we're going to stay there a really long time. Or are we getting there and say, all right, time out, pause. What the hell just happened? What did I do to get me here? Wear the lesson, stare in the mirror, recollect every decision you made to get yourself down or take away the lessons, right? Humble ourselves to the growing opportunity and hustle back on out. That's the difference. The valley should be nothing more than a pit stop. There's nothing wrong with pit stops. Look at it. Look at it like a Formula One car that can run, you know, the, the uh, 24 hours of Le Mans, right? High horsepower cars running full blown 100% for 24 hours. And all they do is take now and again pit stops for fuel, for tires, for windshield wipers and stuff like that, right? But man, if they didn't take those short little stops. Guess what? They'd never survive the 24 hours. If you want to run hard and you want to run fast, these pit stops are healthy. Just don't get hung up in there. Do what you got to do and get back out. Take a step back. Before looking for an antidote, take a break and refocus. So this is where we take, we take exactly what I just said. And we just go a step further. We take a little breather, right? And quite honestly, for me, and I think you guys will embrace this, right? When we've gotten ourselves into a hard spot, into a corner, down in a rut, or we've gotten to a point where, man, it seems like everybody is against us, the cards are stacked against our favor, 
nothing's falling our way, right? It can be a little demoralizing. It can break you down. It can sting a little. This is the time is take time to take a breather. I'm not talking about taking, you know, a week off from work or anything like that, right? Just getting present. And the 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 takeaway of that statement there is this. This is a good thing to write down right here. Being present is when your head and your feet are in the exact same place at the exact same time. In order for that hap to happen, we cannot be worrying about the fretful future or the painful past. We can only be focusing on what's in front of us right here and right now. And in that state, there will be no anxiety. There will be no stress because everything in front of us is now in our control in the present. Whereas when we worry about the fretful future or the fearful past, we're completely out of control, which is the primary contribution to creating stress and anxiety in our life, focusing on things we can't control. So if we're going to take a genuine break, a breather, which is just a, a mental pause, it's so critical that we get here in the present. And that is defined by focusing on the things that we can control in the here and now with our head and our feet in the same place at the exact same time. You know, I think if we did a little inventory of how often we're present in the course of the day, we'd be shocked at how much time we spend worrying about the future or fretting about the past. And then when you equate that to spending time on things that you have no control of, zero control of, you start to realize that, wow, maybe I'm not spending my time all that well. What are some symptoms? Of living in the future and living in the past. Well, stress and anxiety are notable, right? But when stress and anxiety show up in our lives, which are forms of pain, what do we do? We immediately move to anesthetize, make them go away. Now pay attention to this because this is how it creeps up on us. We don't even know it. When pain shows up in our life as adults, we immediately run from it. We make it go away. How do we do that? We procrastinate. We distract. We find ways to take our, our attention away from the pain. Last thing we want to do is address it. So why not avoid it? Oh, no, Pat, man, I'm busy. I'm, I'm, I'm working every day, man. I'm putting a lot of energy and a lot of time, a lot of hours, spending money, man. I'm working. I'm busy. Yeah, well, that's another one. Busy work versus productive work. That's another one. Busy work is a way to avoid doing the things we know we should be doing, the hard work. How do you know if you're stuck in busy work? At the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, you cannot show notable progress towards the outcome, the results you want, as it relates to the amount of effort you put in. Maybe a little here and there, but nowhere near time, energy, and effort that you invested in the busy work. Busy work is not productive work, and busy work is a default state to avoid doing the productive work that for some reason we have these associated pains with. The pain might be, well, what if I fail at doing it? Then you have the, that, that fear of failure, loss, rejection, <clears throat> fear of the unknown, fear of lack of certainty, right? So instead of dealing and addressing with and taking a head up, we just distract. We get busy. We procrastinate. Yeah, but Pat, man, I can't help it. I have so many distractions in my life. Change the language. Distractions do not chase you down, ladies and gentlemen. Distractions do not come after you. As a matter of fact, they do not even know you exist. They couldn't give a crap about you. You go out and find them intentionally. You choose to be distracted. I choose to be distracted. It's not something that happens to us. A victim might believe so, but it doesn't work that way. 
All distractions are something we agree to and accept in our lives. And they're a function of avoiding doing the stuff we should be doing. I doubt anybody will ever get perfect at avoiding all distractions and 100% avoiding procrastination, right? And 100% avoiding busy work. However, we can get really good at it if we start becoming aware around it. And the second we find ourselves accepting busy work or being distracted or procrastinating, we say, stop, pause. What am I avoid doing? What am I avoiding doing right now? And then a bigger question, at what cost? Because when we avoid doing the hard work, we're doing it at a notable cost. The challenge is we're not tracking the cost. Therefore, we let it slide. That's like, you know, that's like having that cheeseburger every day or that Big Mac every day. We're not tracking the cost of those extra 700 calories on our body. Did you know if you just added one Big Mac a day, this will blow you away what I'm about to say, and you changed nothing else, meaning that you still ate the same amount of food you eat, you added one Big Mac a day, okay? A little under 700 calories. In one year, if you didn't change anything else, any other you know, caloric intake, and you didn't change your fitness level, in one year, you'll add almost 60 pounds of raw fat to your body. You can do the math on that. 700 calories a day times 365 days divided by 3,500 calories. That's the amount of calories it requires to burn up or to add a pound of fat. Just under 60 pounds of fat on your body from that one little exercise that you decide to start doing that we didn't track the results of. Now, carry that thought over in a business. Can you imagine how impactful these little things are that we let slide on a daily basis over the course of a year? And yeah, they cost that much. Solicit help. You know, the ch challenge with entrepreneurs, as I've seen, and no doubt, this is probably one of the things that slowed me down the most early on in my career, is I sucked at asking for help. My ego got in my way of it. Just wasn't humble enough. Getting help can be the shortest path back on our feet when we need it. And there is nothing, there's not, nothing humiliating about it. As a matter of fact, on hindsight of looking at the path that I took, I, uh, <laughs> I give Guys and gals, a tremendous amount of credit for stepping up and, and asking for help when they need it the most. And I kind of look at those who are unwilling to ask and be like, huh, you still got that ego chip, don't you? That's easy to recognize from the guy who had the same chip being me. I get it. Don't get stuck being down. Accept it for what it is as part of the process. But don't stay down. You know, I like to, to shape it this way. Just enjoy the flavor of humble pie. You get over it. And it starts to be not that bad after a while. Humility can be a fantastic tool when we utilize it properly. We've got a lot of peers around us that are willing to give us a helping hand if only we ask for it. There's nothing wrong with asking. Here's the thing, right? There's always someone out in front of you. And there's always someone behind us. And that's why we should always be asking for help when we need it and always being willing to give help when someone else asks for it. Don't think for a second, don't think for a second that this is a, uh, a one-way street where you can take it and not give it. It doesn't work that way. And I'll add one more thing. When you help someone else out, and here's the gift back to you and the gift to the person who helps you out. When you're helping someone else out, you're elevating them. When you're elevating them, you cannot help but be on that same elevator at the exact same time. Meaning that the act of elevating someone else this is a great core skill of leadership, right? Leadership 101, man, is elevating those around you. And in doing so, you elevate yourself as a leader. It cannot not happen. 
Not that that is why you offer a helping hand, but it is an inevitable outcome that serves us at a very high level. You know, when sometimes when you're in a tough spot, this may sound counterintuitive. Sometimes when you're in a tough spot, the thing that you need the most is exactly the same thing that you should be giving to someone else. Because in giving it to someone else, we receive it multiple times over. Think about what I just said for a second. Now, that statement is so innately counterintuitive that most people would never go to embrace it. But to give exactly what you need is the fastest way to receive what it is you're seeking. It's just extremely difficult in the moment because we feel like if I need it, how can I give it? Well, we all have, we all always have something, some amount of something to give. We always do without exception. Problem is we go into scarcity mode and because we don't have much of it, we hoard it, what we do have. And that's shutting down our message to the universe that we're of an abundance mindset and that we are creators and that we're born in this, we're into this world to live an abundant life and abundance flows to us. The second we switch into scarcity mindset, keep and protect what I have, we send out a completely different message to the universe and it responds accordingly. Sounds counterintuitive. Most people won't act on that counterintuitive measure. It's too ingrained in us. It doesn't make any sense. Up and until you experience it. Up and until you see others who've operated in that space. When in doubt, whatever it is you need most, there's someone who needs it more than you. Find the opportunity to give them some of what you have. And you will start seeing showing up in your lives in ways you've never expected before. It's exactly how the universe works. So last and final here, right? When we're talking about, we open a show, this is all about results and closing the gap between the knowledge and the information that we have and getting the results that we want. And today we're talking about getting stuck in a rut, getting knocked down, failure, getting uh, a, a poor mental disposition, that loss of motivation because of those around us, right? Well, this all culminates with actually taking action. Show up. Show up. When I say show up, get on the mats. You know, my introduction to martial arts was never planned. It happened by accident. I had given up on everything around fitness when my rugby career came to a screeching halt virtually overnight. And I got mad. It's weird, you know, weird, weird predisposition in humans is that whenever we feel we're wronged, that somebody has to pay for it, right? If something goes wrong in our life, we have to blame someone for it. And boy, I was in that mindset. My 15 years or so of rugby came to a screeching halt through this series of bad concussions. I was told by the doctor that if I played rugby again, I risk being a, a vegetable the rest of my life. That didn't sit too well. And I was struggling. My, I was, I was literally, my brain was struggling with this current concussion with amnesia and things like that. And I said, all right, I'm out, I'm done. And as recovering from that, um, it became, I started to struggle with the fact that this thing that was such a big part of who I was, was gone. This is my self-image. And, and listen, pay attention to this part. because Some of you are going to be able to relate to this. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of veterans coming out of service who've put a lot of time, 10, 20, 30 years in, who experienced something. Of course, at, you know, in your 30 years, it, it's at a much deeper level. But the self-image of who you are, right? It went away overnight. I had no idea who or what my new self-image was or supposed to be. So I put all this energy into our real estate investment company, which on one hand was good at first, right? But I was angry 
And angry energy gets angry results. And I was angry. I was pissed off. Somebody should pay for this misdoing onto me, which, you know, talking about it now and you listening, you're like, well, Pat, that's stupid. Why would you ever think like that? Because we're predisposed to blame someone when we feel like we've been wrong. And I felt I had a lot, I was playing in an international level. I felt I had a lot of years left. I felt I was in my prime and boom, was taken away, stolen from me. How dare someone? But there was no someone to blame. See kind of the, the challenge I was in? So I took all that angry energy, put it in the work to a destructive way. I'd set goals. We'd, we'd push so hard. We'd break the team. We'd achieve those goals just so I could burn it down and set a, another unachievable goal. And it got very counterproductive at work. Yes, we got certain results, but at the, at the, the cost was through the roof in, in terms of people costs. Well, one day, my son, so this anger drove me into quitting the gym. I mean, quitting athletics altogether, okay? And five years later, I find myself physically out of shape, not looking too good, and being a really crappy role model for my kids. One day, my son asked me, he said, Dad, a gym opened up. Would, uh, could, would you mind bringing me down there to work out? And I didn't think much, enough, much of it. I said, sure, let's go. So I bring him down, and we go into the gym, and the moment I walked in there and looked around, I felt the energy. It, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I got a very emotional. What a shitty role model I've been for my kids. And that I got to change that right now. And I got a membership for the entire family in this gym. This gym happened to have uh, fitness and martial arts. Anyways, long story short, I was short in the story. Um, started out with cardio kickboxing. After a few months of doing cardio kickboxing, I looked over to the uh, side there and I saw these guys grappling, rolling with these dresses on or what karate outfits on i didn't know you know i go over there i'm like what are you guys doing They're like oh it's jujitsu i'm like well what do you do They're like oh yeah we choke each other and we arm bar each other and we, we 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 you know grapple around i'm like really that looks pretty awesome I'm like you know i'm a physical guy played rugby i'm like what what do you got to do to get started what's next and this is the part i'm getting at that i want you guys to take away right very simply like just show up. And showing up in jiu-jitsu didn't mean watching videos. It didn't mean studying a book. It didn't mean taking a lecture. It means getting on the mats and training, like live training, like getting choked out training, like getting arm barred training. Just show up. It's kind of funny because it wasn't that much longer until I looked down. We're in a mezzanine. Um, part of the gym, that's where the jiu-jitsu mats were. And I look down and I see guys training down there inside the cage and a couple guys are talking about the fights from the weekend. And I'm like, what, guys, what are you talking about fights? What do you mean fights? And they responded like, yeah, the fights from the weekend. He fought, he won, he didn't win. MMA fights, I'm asking questions. I'm like, like you go in and punch each other? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had never even watched the UFC at this point. Mind you, I was like 39 years old already, right? And, uh, I'm like, well, that, you know, we used to fight a lot on the rugby field. Pretty good at that, too. I'm like, what does it take to get started? And what do you think they said? Just show up. And showing up was not studying videos. Wasn't just training. It was getting in the cage and getting punched. It was learning through the experience of execution. Take action. Take action. Take action. When you take action, you control the situation. You're the causation. Things around you have to respond to what you're doing. Versus when you stand still, you become the response to somebody else's causation. We don't have time for that. We don't have time to let the rest of the world figure out what's going to happen for us. You know, the final thing I'll leave you here, and then we're going to switch back screens, right? Get clear on your plan and get clear on the results. When we operate without a plan, we flutter, we flounder. We'll, 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 we'll spin our wheels. We'll put in the time. We'll spend the money. We'll exhaust the resources, but we won't make any damn progress. And we certainly won't get the results. 
Get clear on what it is you want, exactly what it is you want. Put a timestamp on it. Reverse engineer that and come up with a plan. And then get in. Be okay with getting a little bloodied along the way. We heal nicely. It's okay. Those scars become our badges of honor. That's what gives us credibility. That's what gives us confidence going forward that we can do this because we've already done this. But get in the cage and start now. I'm going to switch back screens here, guys, okay? Come back over here. Boom. All righty. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is our presentation today on the steps of getting out of a challenging space, okay? And we can apply this anywhere we want at any given time, right? Do you have any questions, comments, things you'd like to talk to? Let's get into that now. There's a comment here saying lack of concentration, disturbed sleep. So disturbed sleep's a big one. We need our sleep to recover, right? We need our sleep to replenish, right? And you say, well, what are we recovering? Well, our physical, mental, emotional, our particular our emotional currency, right? Our decision-making power. When we sit in bed at night and we stress and angst, over either something that's already happened or something that we think might happen at some point in the future, which is just this made up construct of time, right? We disallow ourselves from recovering. And here's what, here's what's happening internally, right? When we worry about something that we can't control and we trigger that sympathetic nervous system, that releases chemicals into our body, right? Like adrenaline, like endorphins that keep us awake. And it's those chemicals that are, that prevent us from getting into the deep REM recovery sleep, even if we fall asleep, because we mentally triggered this chemical factory. And we can go all night that way. We can wake up in the same state because there's nothing to pull us out, back in homeostasis, back out of sympathetic and into that parasympathetic nervous system, out of fight or flight and into a stabilized space. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The antidote is the same. It's simple, right? We have to get our head and our feet in the here and now, not worrying about what may happen in the future and not worrying about what's already happened in the past. We can't change this. So grow from it. No other alternatives. You know, somebody asked me the other day, we got in this conversation. My younger brother passed three years ago. He's 18 years my junior. Think about that for a second, right? Never did I expect my 33-year-old brother to pass before me at, you know, at that 50 years old, whatever the math is there, right? He said, Pat, when it's brought up, are you sad about that? I'm like, I'm not. Not at all. Why would I be sad? Why would I want to go back and think about the sad part of him when I can go back and think about the positive, strong, empowering, exciting parts of his life and where he is today and how awesome he must be right now. Why would I allow myself to go to a bad place when I could choose to go to a good place? And both are a choice. We all have things in the past that suck. Would you not agree? Right? Reliving the suckiness puts us exactly in this cycle I'm talking about. Here's something if you're unfamiliar with how this works in our body. Very interesting. In reality, you're jogging down the street, big grizzly bear jumps in front of you, raw, wants to cut you in half. It immediately triggers that same fight or flight. Fight, flight, or hide, right? Sympathetic nervous system kicks in, boom. Adrenaline rush, boom. Blood rushes to all the extremities, all to our muscles. We get extremely focused on our body, on our space and time. How much time do we have to fix this? How do we protect our body? And how much space do we have to get away? That's where our focus goes. That's fight or flight. Nothing internal. 
Well, in today's world, when we trigger that fight or flight by thought, which is very easy to do, by worrying about something in the future, fretting about something in the past, we could we create the exact same visual response. We shut down most of our most of the workings of our organs. Our immune system goes into part-time mode, right? All of our blood flows to our extremities. This chemical factory goes in overdose. We get focused on the externals again. When in fact, we should be focused on the internals. But here's the problem. When we mentally trigger that, see when the grizzly bear is there and we run our ass out in the woods, we climb a big tree and a grizzly bear can't get us, we realize we're safe. Guess what? We automatically realize that the, that the risk has been mitigated and we automatically, then naturally go back into a state of homeostasis. We decompress. Everything goes back to the way it was. But when we mentally trigger it, there's nothing to pull it back unless we pull it back. We're going to say, no, enough is enough. I'm sick of being stressed and angst. I'm sick of worry right now. And I'm going to get focused on the here and now. I'm going to stop, pause. What's going on? What's in my control and what's not? And I'll leave you guys with this, right? Every single morning, couple things we got to do. One of them is what's in my control today? What's not? And make sure we're only focusing on the things that are in our control. And if the things that aren't, we can only focus on how they affect us. But stop trying, stop trying to change things you can't change. That's a fool's battle. Second thing, once we identify what it is we're trying to do today, and here's a big one. Remember that little mirror exercise I talked about at the very beginning of the show, right? Stare into a mirror. Stare into a mirror. Ask yourself, who's that looking back at me right now? What do I see? Who do I see? What's going to get revealed, right? Are the top one or two or three behavioral shortcomings that we have, which is awesome. Because that's the exact same answer that we seek first thing in the morning. In order to do this thing I got to do today, right? Because today is going to be bigger than yesterday. It's a goal each day to outperform ourselves from yesterday. 1% better day. In order to be better today than I was yesterday, who do I got to become? And that's not task. That's not technique. That's not strategy. That's behavior. That's something we've got to change. Because in order to have this thing that we don't currently have that we're talking about, that's on the other side of the river right now, we have all the skills, the knowledge, expertise. We're in the right place at the right time. We have the right support team, group, pro, group program that we're in. We got all that. But we want to get across the river. You're the missing link. You can't have this until you do this. And you can't do this until you become this. So every morning... Who do I need to become today in order to do what I have to do today in order to get to the other side of the river today? Step by step, ladies and gentlemen, bit by bit, ladies and gentlemen, let's chunk away with this. Okay. You guys have been awesome, man. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. For those who are new to Peak Performance Mastery, remember this is the same place, same time, right here in your Facebook groups. Ready to roll. If you're on the Peak Performance Master site with us here, uh, that's awesome as well. We'll be here every single week. You are welcome to send in questions throughout the week uh, into your groups or into the, face, the Peak Performance Master group here. I will, um, I will answer them throughout the week as we go. And if there's topics, if there's things that you want to address and get to, right, or you want to uncover and have just an open, candid conversation on, you are more than welcome to share them as well, okay? This is for us. Remember, we're here to loosen things up around us, to open the doors, the paths to getting the results that we not only want, but we freaking deserve in this world. We're born into an abundance world. It's only us, only us, that's stopping us from receiving all the abundance that the universe and God has waiting for us. You guys are awesome, man. Have an amazingly awesome week. Peace.